So the message that I was getting tonight was based on some conversations like we've had recently in our family, in our group, and um, last week, and then today I got to speak with Eddie and Andy, pastors, about offense. And I was praying, I was like, offense. Okay. I think, yeah. Lord's talking to us. He's man. talking to us. Is that what you guys talked about last night? No, not specifically, but it just, it's a recurring theme. Yeah, so theme. I was praying, and I was praying, I was like, Lord, what do you want us to, to, to discuss? So I looked up the definition first of offense, and it says a breach of a law or a rule, an illegal act. And then an example is neither offense violates any federal law. And then I know we also know the social thing, you get offended. Something hurts your feelings, you don't like it, you feel like a, an affront, a personal affront was done against you, right? So one thing that I keep being reminded of is like we live in a fallen world. There, we are on rough terrain here. This is not yet heaven, but we bring them the kingdom wherever we go. We've got Jesus, we've got Holy Spirit, so it's a mixture, right? We have Holy Spirit, we bring the kingdom with Jesus Christ in us, and with each other, we can pray for each other, edify each other, teach, instruct, help, encourage, equip. But, but and pray for each other is big. Um, but we're in fallen territory because of the fall. So just to remember that that's our backdrop right here. We're not here yet up in the perfection of heaven since the fall. But we can, we're achieving that. We're, we're a, a working towards attain that, right? And that was last week's message was on becoming more mature sons and daughters of God. He's wanting us to go glory to glory, you know, higher and higher in him. And and each time we overcome an offense and each time we choose honor and we choose uh, to be obedient rather than disobedient or, you know, when the enemy hits us, I always say he's like a punk bully. He does a sucker punch. He knows where we're weak. He's got his little minions following us. They, he know, they know, they follow, they know where we're weak, right? But God uses everything that the enemy means for evil for our good. So it's like we get tested, we get sifted. Things happen in this fallen world that we're in and it's an opportunity to overcome with love. And that's what we were talking about today, Pastor Eddie and Angie. And Pastor Eddie has wisely said this before. He said it last week too, and I think on Sunday as well. You know, when an offense comes, it's up to us whether we take the offense, whether we, whether we nurse that offense, whether we bite into that apple, so then to like take on to it. But it's an opportunity to recognize when things come our way, like, okay, maybe I'm getting sifted right now. Maybe for whatever reason, the enemy took a sucker punch because he knew I was tired. He knew I was extra weak right now. He does not fight fair. Usually, in my experience, when the enemy hits is when you're the weakest. And it's usually out of the blue. It can also usually happen when you feel really good. It's like you're not expecting it. You're like, yay, everything's going pretty good. Yay, I feel happy in the Lord. Woo, I got victory. And then bam, just comes out of the blue. Because he wants to steal, kill, and destroy, right? So um, this is a scripture in Matthew 13, 37 to 43. And this is Jesus talking. He says, he answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So I thought that was interesting. I hadn't really ever seen that all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. Here, Jesus is saying that will be dealt with. He's the righteous judge. His angels are going to do the harvest. So just remember that when offense, when you, when, when attacks come, when offense comes, just remember like righteous judgment is going to happen because God sees everything. Our job is to not take the bait of offense, to forgive, and to try not to, like, in your anger, do not sin, right? I get angry with injustice. Jesus got angry with injustice. Jesus flipped some tables. He was not always polite. He called them brood of vipers. 
which you'll see, I have a few scriptures here. There were moments where Jesus got angry, but Jesus never sinned. You know, you can call a spade a spade without sinning, but he always was so compassionate to the lost, so compassionate to the broken. And that's where we want to be, that, that grace, like just extend grace. We don't know everybody's story or journey or where they've come from. We only have our perspective. So just he's just encouraging us, as Eddie was really reminding me today, grace, extend grace, right? Um, then he says in Luke 17, 2, talking about those who offend one of these little ones, Luke 17, 2, it says, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea that he should offend one of these little ones. And again, I think that offense is talking about the breach of a law or a rule, an illegal act, doing something that violates his law and his ultimate law is love. You love the Father God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You love the neighbor as yourself. If you're doing those two things, you fulfill the whole law is what Jesus taught us, right? But if you're doing something selfish, abusive, and you're, you're stumbling, especially little ones, he takes that very serious. It's not good. <laughs> um, then another one in Job 34, 31, I just looked this up. I, I didn't get to dig into it that much, but Job said, for has anyone said to God, I have borne chastening, I will offend no more. To me, and I don't know if you guys have anything to share on that one, what he was just basically saying is like, we all have the, we all can offend. We all can make, we all make mistakes. We all offend. At some point or another, we all break the law. None of us are perfect. We all do it. So he's saying, even though we get chastened, you know, can anybody say, I'll never do it again. I'll be perfect. No, I don't think so. Only Jesus is perfect, right? So again, just extending grace. Um, a brother offended is harder to win than a strong city and contentions are like the bars of a castle. That's Proverbs 18, 19. So that's a good picture of just realizing once, once offense happens, once an unju injustice is done, it's very hard to win that brother or sister back. And, and again, like Eddie has said, it, but that's up to the person offended to forgive and not allow the offense. Don't keep nursing the offense because that is exactly what Satan wants. You know, you may have a right to be hurt or angry. It could be a complete injustice because like I said, the enemy is a punk and he hits you when you're low. He does not fight fair. He comes to steal, kill and destroy. But just remember, Jesus comes to bring you abundant life and every offense is an opportunity to graduate in the spirit, to go up a level in the spirit go glory to glory it's an opportunity jesus warned peter peter satan has asked me to sift is asked to sift you like wheat sifting is never pleasant things are shaken up right but the sifting is to get rid of the lumpy stuff and, and purify us just like the refiner's fire the fire never feels good when the heat's turned up nobody likes to be in the fire but that's where the dross is removed and the gold is purified, right? And in the kiln, like you were talking about last week, there's vessels of honor. The clay vessels are the ones that are in the potter's hands and they're being molded on the wheel. But to make them useful, they still gotta go in the fire. They come out of the fire, then they're hardened and ready to be used in their form that the potter intended, right? So um, then Jesus speaking to his disciples said, it is impossible that no offense should come but woe to him through whom they come. That's Luke 17, 1. So here he's talking to his disciples and he's basically saying, look, it's gonna come. Offense is gonna come. The, the lawlessness in the world is gonna happen, but woe to him who comes through. So again, like instead of looking at the plank and everybody, or the speck and everybody else's eye, look to your own eyes, look to your own actions and your own behavior. Are you causing offense? Be careful, you know, look at your, what you're doing because we can't control anybody else but ourselves but we're accountable to the Lord, right? And if we are accountable to him and we can overcome that offense and choose to forgive and choose to love and choose just, just keep forgiving, keep loving. Um, now that doesn't mean we don't set healthy boundaries. That doesn't mean, sometimes we have to. Sometimes we have to because like I was talking to Eddie and Angie, I was like, you know, if someone comes in and, and causes disruption or causes division or causes like offenses or confusion or chaos, like sometimes you have to set boundaries because if they're lost or hurting or deceived, sometimes they can just bring stuff in. 
but that doesn't mean you don't love them. It doesn't mean you got to love the whole, the whole, everybody. <laughs> you got to love out everybody, you know, and what's freedom for one person may be an offense or a stumbling block to another. We know that in scripture too. Some people can eat meat. Other people, it stumbles them. And some people have the freedom to have an alcoholic beverage and they don't get drunk. Other people can't touch it. And if you drink in front of them, it will stumble them. So what does Jesus say? He says, don't use your freedom to basically if it'll stumble somebody else, right? So anyways, then um, Jesus again says, woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. That's Matthew 18, 7. Um, when John the Baptist was put in prison, it was interesting that Jesus had to tell him, basically, look, I'm going to be an offense for some people. Some people are going to stumble over me. Jesus said that, right? And we know he says, if the world hates you, it's because it hated me. And when, when John the Baptist was in the prison and he heard about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, are you, com are you the coming one or are we supposed to look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you see and hear. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Can you believe that? I'm like, what? Can, why would people be offended that people are being healed and set free and delivered? The blind can see, but people got offended. Who gets offended? We'll talk about that in a little bit. The Pharisees, and I got this, they were jealous, envy, jealousy, envy. As they, as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I say to you, and more than a prophet, for this is he who, of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you and you did not lament. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and yet they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. So the brood of vipers is the ones who got offended by Jesus. And that was in another scripture here. Oh, by the way, the one I just read was Matthew 11, 2 to 19. So this verse, Jesus, again, like I said, he wasn't always a sweet pacifist. Sometimes he just was a bam. He said, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear and understand, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth that this defiles a man. Then his disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Why do you think that is? Well, I'll, I'll finish. But Jesus said, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Again, that's Matthew 15, 7 to 14. So what do you guys think about that? When I thought that, you know, Pat was like, I think you're supposed to teach on that. And I was like, I don't really get anything from it. But when I started looking into the offense topic and the forgiveness and the love topic, that scripture was there. And it mentions that the Pharisees were offended. So I was like, you were right, honey. 
the, the Pharisees were offended by Jesus. And Jerry, you brought a great point. Why? Because of jealousy. They were the answer before Jesus. They were the people that uh, were uh, you know, adored. And uh, but it went to their head. Jesus came to show them a better way. They just didn't want to let go. Amen. They wanted to be adored. They, were, they wore their phylacteries on their robes. And they liked to make a show of how righteous they were. And people looked to them for atonement, the priests and stuff. And they didn't like that Jesus one up them. <laughs> to say the least. They loved the praises of men, another pastor says. They loved the praises of men. They loved the attention and the power and the, you know, the, probably the money that went with it. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the prestige. They were God's representatives before they came. The prestige. Right. They were God's representatives yeah. before they came. Before Jesus came, and Jesus came in meek, riding on a donkey, like we talked about last week, humble. Yeah. So that humility, and and the fact that everywhere Jesus went, there were crowds flocking to him, because because true signs and wonders and healing was happening. The the blind were seeing, the deaf were hearing. The dead were being raised. Um, there were so many miracles that were happening. And it wasn't good enough for the Pharisees. You remember, I forget what passage, but after Jesus is doing all these amazing things, then they said to him, show us a sign that we may believe. You're like, and it's like, really? How many more <laughs> do you need? And yes. of course, the station is like to use that to see. See, we're not supposed to seek after signs and miracles. And, and that's the whole point. Right. It was also an attempt to control Jesus. Yeah. Uh-huh. There you go. Right, control is a big one. You know what that reminds me of is in the wilderness, and he said, if you are the son of God, then do this. Then yeah. you can throw yourself off this mountain, basically. Yeah, and the one was made bread out of the rock. Yep, yeah. make turn this bread and stone into bread. And he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Well... And then this is another great one. So again, when Jesus, it says, Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. He who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. Now as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answers saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one who is mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. That's Luke 3, 7 to 17. And then again, he said to the scribes and the Pharisees and the hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? I mean, this is Jesus talking. God really was showing me this because I'd never seen this before. And I'm like, whoa, why have I never seen this? <laughs> Therefore, indeed, I send you the prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in the synagogues and persecute from city to city that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Barakiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, 
all these things will come upon this generation. That's Matthew 23, 29 to 36. Then I end on a more positive note where Jesus is now addressing the children of God, not the Pharisees, not the serpents, not the brood of vipers. He says, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. So it's like really clear to me, like when he rebukes people, it's because they are not his children. They're, they're not keeping the, the law of love. They're, they're in pride. They're not, they're wanting the praise of men. It's the Pharisees, it's the hypocrites. They're pointing out everybody else's fault, but they're not looking at their own, right? If you're, if you're loving and forgiving and you're walking in Christ via the Holy Spirit and you do forgive and you do walk humbly, He's not talking to you, you know, but it's a good, it's a good reminder because we can all go there. We can all stumble over offense. We can all get hardened in our heart at times if we're not careful, right? So it's just a good reminder. So he says, whoever does not practice righteousness is not a God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother, he says, and why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to say to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My, lit my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. That's 1 John 3, 10 to 18. So I got some more scriptures on, on like in Proverbs with offense. Um, he who covers a transgression seeks love. But he who repeats a matter separates friends, right? The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. That's Proverbs 19 to 11. 19, 11. So these are some guides and wisdom from the Lord on how do, we, how do we overlook offense? How do we, don't repeat the offense publicly, right? Go directly to your brother. Try to win him over. That's the biblical model, right? And if you can't win them over, you bring another person. You try to win them over. Long-suffering. Forgive, pray, forgive, exhort, forgive, love, forgive, teach, forgive. You know, try. Keep trying to win them over because God is, is long, what is he, long-suffering? He wants that no one will perish. But I think, too, you know, and we were talking today about this, like, love isn't always easy. It's not always soft and gentle sometimes a rebuke is the most loving thing right proverbs also says that the wounds of a friend are better than the kisses of an enemy but how do we do that in love right it's not easy it is not easy right yes jerry um just that on that very topic and, I, and we've probably all seen this happen somebody gives a word of correction and it's out of frustration it's not out of love. It's out of their own hurt or frustration. And the finger points and the tone of voice says it. The body language says it. And that's not the spirit's leaving right there. That's that's their own Flesh. Wound, hurt, their own wound. Right. And, and like it's not to say that it's not a legitimate correction. Right. But but the it's just it's not being done in love. You know. So it, so if you're the one that the Lord wants to bring that correction. Then pray that through. Get Him. your own heart healed. In, in, you know, before you go again, the log. Get the log. Right? Get the log out of our own eye. Yeah. And Amen. Then, and then the other thing about just, it's interesting because the word offense in the scriptures is used a little differently than we commonly use it. We're talking about getting hurt by someone, mm -hmm. by somebody offending us, and there most of the passages seem to be like like a true offense of the rules and the laws and God's principles and offending in that way but there was some crossover too mm -hmm. so very interesting study but isn't when, it but when we're talking about us being offended and we say this all the time we got to own it 
you know, so I know for me personally, when I'm hurt, offended, whatever mm -hmm. term you want, and it, it's like, it, and it lingers, it hurts too much, it's like, wait a minute. It's mm -hmm. like if I'm rooted and grounded in love, people can say whatever the heck they want to say, and it doesn't offend me, it doesn't hurt me, it just literally blows off. Right. But when somebody's words pierce, and the Lord is showing me, it's like, that's hurting too much, or like there's something, and so I just automatically go to the Lord now, and it's like, Lord, this hurts more than it needs to. Yeah. What's going on here? You know, and seeking the Lord's healing, really, because ultimately it's wounding. Amen. If it's hurting, then it's, that's wounding, right? And it's usually a trigger of some deeper wound that Amen. God wants to bring out Amen. so he can do the healing. Amen. Somebody you know, wants to. I've noticed that pattern over Amen. and over and over. I mean, Amen. think about even the Pharisees. Amen. They wanted attention. They wanted yes. to be accepted. They have it, can you relate to that? I want to be accepted. I want to be loved, right? Yeah. And I didn't get it as a kid, apparently, so I learned these ways to be out there and be the guy getting all the attention, whatever, you know? And the Lord has showed me that you don't need that kind of attention. That's attention. That's pleasing man. That's man-pleasing attention. Right. I don't need that kind of attention. And as I grow more and more in the Lord and His love and His attention, because His eye is always on us. Yeah. And that, he, we're the apple of His eye. Yeah. He sings over us. That yeah. blows my mind. Yeah. That, that the Lord's always working in, but even before we knew Him, He's yeah. wooing us and, and yeah. revealing things to us. And so, yeah, as I grow more and more in that, just being rooted and grounded in love yeah. and experience, Experiencing his love, not just head knowledge, but really, yeah, I know God loves me, leave me alone. No, really opening my heart. Mm -hmm. Like worship is taking on a whole new meaning, or what we typically call worship time. It's, it's the time when we're loving the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the Lord showed me, as you guys have heard me testify the last few months or whatever, that the Lord wants to show me his love Amen. through a lot of these songs and this, in the lyrics and everything. Mm -hmm. So my time with the Lord worshiping is different now. Amen. It's like, I, Lord, I want to spend time loving you and worshiping you and receiving your love for me and Amen. purposely spending time just with my heart open my arms usually open and just listening to the words of the songs and, and really receiving the lord's love and healing and, and just you know Amen. And just continuing to grow in that mm -hmm. until those things until we are truly unoffendable that's my goal i want to be unoffendable right you can say whatever you want you can do whatever you want and it's not gonna i mean they it might be you know, it's, they're saying it really against the Lord. Exactly. Maybe jealousy or whatever. Yeah. But it won't. It won't hurt my heart because I'm healed. I'm set free. Amen. I'm, I'm like fully loved. How do I'm you? Not there yet, just so you know, no, yeah, we're all we're all we're all working on it. But, yeah, but, but when you have a broken toe or like a bit, somebody said this once, if your toe was like smashed and it's big and blood and ready and red and bloody, and if someone just accidentally steps on it, it hurts. So it's like if you have a wound like that. Now the person may I'm totally not even seen the toe, didn't know it was so wounded, accidentally just bumped up against it, a little bump, and it could feel like a rah because of that wound, right? So that's the other thing. Sometimes people feel things so much more than you're just like, whoa, I did not intend that at all because you kind of stepped on a mine in their life and you didn't know it. Um, then you get a chance to pray for them. When you see that there's a huge wound and their toe is all big and bloody, you know, you just know, oh, we gotta be really careful to not step on that big bloody toe and pray for that healing. Um, but there was something else I was gonna say I've had, you know, sharing a little with Eddie and Angie, and you know Jerry, um, and you know Tracy, and you're, you're learning. Um, I've had people publicly slander me or come against me and stuff, and it's been very painful. But, but it was more like there's a, there's a, uh, there's a part of me for ju a justice warrior, and I get like, I get mad when people are coming against my Lord. You know, like King David, when the giant was taunting him. And, and like mocking him and coming against God, that makes me mad. I'm like, don't you talk about my father like that. You know, then I get like, mm. <laughs> like I don't, I'm going to stand up and fight because I'm like, no. Or if I see someone potentially bullying sheep or, or like a potential wolf-like scenario or goats butting the sheep, then I get mad. I'm like, uh-uh, no. I feel a responsibility to say something if I see that kind of behavior. And it's tricky because it's like, yeah, like you said, do I, is it me getting offended? Is it just my flesh or am I actually seeing something? What I've learned to do in those scenarios when I see something out of order or a potential goat-like behavior, butting a, you know, horns on a sheep or, or if I see stuff breaking out where I'm like, whoa, what is this, God? I'm learning, like, pray, don't react immediately because if I do, I may be in error in doing it in the flesh. Um, 
Doesn't mean I don't want to. <laughs> doesn't mean my flesh isn't rising up going, I don't like this, you know. But I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray. I ask the Lord for wisdom. I say, Lord, what was that? And sometimes I'm literally up all night asking him and going, Lord, what was that? What do I do? How should I address that? What is that me? Was that them? Was that a combo? Was that something from the enemy? Was, what was that? Was that flesh? I really seek him and for wisdom and guidance. And usually one thing he's shown me is though, if someone does offend you or do something against you, um, usually it's not personal. And if it's something he's trying to bring out to light in them, they'll do it to others as well. Not that I'm like, oh, yay, they're going to go do it to other people. Woo, woo, I'm excited about that. But you will see the pattern. And so he's taught me sometimes just pray for truth to come to light. Pray for blinders to fall from their eyes. Pray for the blinders to come off their ears so they hear his voice more clearly. Pray for healing. But be rest assured, if it is an issue that, that they have, it will come to light and it will happen to others as well. Now, again, there's that responsibility I have too, though. If I don't warn people and say, be careful, I'm just letting you know this happened. There's, a, there's something going on there that wasn't aligned with the kingdom of God. Just keep praying, but be aware, be aware. Because like, if I don't warn and others get hurt, I always think of Ezekiel 3 and 33, the watchman verse. God spoke that to me years ago. He's like, if you see your brother or sister and they're going to get trapped in a sin or danger is coming and you don't warn them, and they fall into the pit or they fall into that trap or they get injured because you didn't warn them, their blood is on your hands. But if you see and you warn them and they keep going, their blood is no longer on your hands. So I take that seriously. And I know that's an Old Testament prophetic verse, but God spoke that directly to me, to my heart. And so I always wrestle with that. I'm like, okay, Lord, I don't want to be alarmist. I don't want to be negative Nancy. I don't want to be critical. I don't want any of that. But if I see it, I feel a responsibility. I need to warn, you know, but I still pray for the grace. I pray for how to, okay, now the wisdom, how do I warn? First go to that person, try to work it out with them. Try to bring correction and say, hey, you know, let's work this out. Sometimes I'll be, listen, I was such a people pleaser my whole life. I wanted everybody to love me. I never wanted, I won Miss Friendship in high school. I won homecoming queen, prom queen. I was a cheerleader. I wanted validation. I wanted people to love me. And I loved people. I, I did. It was a sincere like love for people. And, and I wanted that love back. But when the Lord called me into his kingdom and when he anointed me and called me and, and gave me like a prophetic mantle, I had to get over that fear of man. I had to get over that people pleasing. And it was hard. And it still is. It is not my first go-to. But I, bottom line is I have to answer to him. If he's given me a word to speak, if he's shown me something, I, I take it very serious, you know? Um, but I, ask, I say, pray for grace. Pray for all of us to have grace as we're all in community together. And as some of us have big bloody toes and some of us have been punched and beat up and there's a lot of woundedness in us, right, in the body. We have to pray for wisdom. How do we bring correction in a healthy way? Because God does prune us. He does allow sifting. He does allow it. And, and just keep each other in prayer, you know? And if you're the one who gets offended, like I've seen people kind of act funny with me and like look at me funny. And I thought, uh-oh, something happened. I don't know what. I'm gonna go right to the source. I don't bring it up to anybody else. I go, I go to the Lord and I go straight to that person. Is everything okay with us? Have I offended you? And they're like, uh, no. And they're, they're taken aback. But I'm doing it in love being direct because that's what the word says to do. And I'm like, look, have I offended you? Because I perceived something. I sensed it. Now, maybe I'm wrong in my perception. But if I'm not wrong, I want to give the opportunity for us to work it out. Has there, is there something I've done? And, and they'll, you know what, I've done that. And then that, like with one brother, I won't, no, no names mentioned. And they were a little like shocked, but they were, it was so good because whatever it was, I don't even know. But the next time I saw them, they were like, you know what, don't ever take it personal. You know, I'm not offended with you. Maybe I was just aloof that day. And I'm like, okay, cool, thanks. You know, and we're good. We have a great 
respect and honor with each other. So honor, that's going to be a topic for another day. But I believe what Eddie has been saying lately about that is one of the keys to the kingdom. That is something God has shown me too. And that's why I'm always so big on the order, the kingdom order, because it's a way to honor one another, right? But even when we do that, it always has to be in love and patience. <laughs> and I'm guilty of not always being patient, so pray for me. <laughs> um, but anyways, do you guys have anything else you want to share? Did it bring up any points for you personally or... Any? What? Boundaries? Getting upset and everything about it because we got into a big fight yesterday. And I tried to tell him, you need to set boundaries, but he won't just listen to me. Because he's saying that I'm being an idiot, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and you know, all this is just getting me pretty upset. Because I checked my checking account yesterday, well, actually my savings account. I thought I had the money in there for my rent for Monday. I don't. So I don't know what I'm going to do now. I have rent coming up Monday. And it's really bothering me a lot lately. Because I know I need to set boundaries with this person, but he just won't listen to me. He's saying, go, if you're going to be this way, screw you. I won't talk to you for the rest of the day. If he said what? He so said, if you're going to be like this, I'm not going to talk to you for the rest of the day. That's the hard thing. Sometimes when you stop people, people pleasing, people stop being pleased. Sometimes setting a boundary is healthy and it's required and not everybody likes it. And, oh well, what can you do? You so know, least, boundaries and I told him I've been trying my best and everything, but I don't know what I'm going to do. He goes, well, you need to figure something out. And I said, all right, fine, whatever. And I just hung up. He's been trying to call me today, but I've been hanging up on him, trying to set some boundaries from him. Well, we will pray for you tonight, for sure, if you want prayer. Because it, it hurts. Mm -hmm. Why not? I don't have my rent money now. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know how to talk to my managers about it either. Yeah. Um, I've noticed through the years that as I was, as I was getting offended or, or felt like I was you know, offended by what people would say, especially like at work, if they uh, something happened and, and uh, like between me and, a, and another person at work, I'll take offense to it because I'll feel like, well, you know, that this, they don't like me or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. and then and it ends up not even being that at all. Mm -hmm. But I've learned though um, that I can't let I can't let people offend me and, and and have it, I don't know if this makes sense, have it bother me. Does that make sense? Yes. I mean, you have to let it go. If you want to if you want to move on with the person, like you said, you can go to them and talk to them, but if they feel like that they didn't offend you or whatever, then you just you have to let it go, you know? Can you do that? Yeah, there's, there's not much you can do if, if they're not willing to, you know, to work. I don't know if that you makes can sense. You boundaries to protect yeah. yourself, but that's all you want. You can't yeah. control anybody but yourself, right? We've got our own accountability with the Lord, and we do. We are also accountable for how we treat each other, but we can't fix anybody else. Right. That's that's their decision, yeah. right? That's true. That was my decision yesterday. To have a boundary. To have some boundaries. Mm -hmm. it's, not easy, no. it's not easy. It's not easy. It's taken me a while to get to that point, you know, to where, okay, I'm not going to let, let that offend me, it's, you know, it's, it's gone, you know. Well, when you think about it, Satan, one of the words is Diablo, which is dart thrower, right. or arrow thrower, so he's, and, and it's renewing our mind, right, because the mind, we have to take our thoughts captive, he's throwing darts at people's minds, and he throws it at our mind about each other, about ourselves, and he's always trying to, like, ch -ch. Um, so we have to take those thoughts captive. You have to take those darts and recognize, recognize, oh, Satan's trying to get at me with those darts and those fiery darts. And or even through people. People can throw darts, you right. know? And so because they're wounded, because they have hardness of heart, because they don't understand the love of God yet. They haven't been 
you know, they haven't had their hearts softened yet, right? So they can hurt you. And and so like what we talk about the world is this fallen place. There's treacherous ground, you know? But this is another thing he was saying to me. Um, when, I was, when we were leaving our trail, there's new tenants on the street right near our house. And they park, and they step kind of far out in the street. So every time I'm coming out, I'm trying to turn left. That big I, truck? Yeah. Yes. And then there's another car that. that sticks out too. So I'm like, I really you can't see to turn left. It's dangerous, right? And so I'm like, gosh, dang it. And I'm like, I asked the, my neighbor, sorry. <laughs> I asked my neighbor, you know I don't have a religious spirit, right? Um, I asked my neighbor, I said, hey, can you, I don't have the tenant's name or number, but could you please ask them if they would maybe just park closer to that curb so we can see, because I don't want an accident. Nope, it hasn't been done, hasn't been done. And every time I feel myself like get angry because I'm like, I don't want to have an accident. I don't want anybody to have an accident. And, and, um, but then I was thinking about it. I'm like, Sonia, why are you angry? You don't know this person. They probably have no clue. They, they're not thinking that them parking too far close to the street is making it dangerous for others. That's, that's probably the first, they're not doing it on purpose. And so I started thinking about it. I'm like, yeah, but why, why are people more aware of other people? Like the things they do. And, I, and then I was thinking about that. He's like, well, there's a lot going on in the world right now. People have a lot on their minds. Just getting up and getting to work, and paying the rent, and getting home, and feeding themselves, and feeding their kids, and feeding their pets, and paying their electric bill, and doing there's there's it's a struggle. The the world we know it says in the last days it's an increase of wickedness. Do not let your heart grow cold. Jesus told us that it's hard. So to to for that person, for my neighbor to be thinking that much about other people, it's probably not realistic. It would be nice, but it's not happening. So at some point, if I get to meet them, I'm going to very nicely say, hey, would you mind? We just, you know, sometimes we just can't see, and I just don't want to have an accident. Now, they may give me, they may put me off. They may say, screw you, we don't care. I've had that happen. I've asked people very nicely before, hey, I can't get in my driveway when you park there. They're parking there every day. What wow. can you do? Yeah. That's the world we're living in right now. But you know what? I went from blowing a gasket at first, because I was so mad, to the Lord's self in my heart, and I started praying for them. I prayed for them all the time. He changed my heart. And that's when you know he's working on you. Yeah. Right? So it's possible. Yeah. You might get offended right away, but just say, Lord, like, I know I'm not having the right heart here because he said, if you hate your brother, if you have, if you say you love God, but you hate your brother, you're deceived. So I'm like, what if they're not my brother? Maybe it's one of Satan's kids. And he's like, pray for them. I'm like, okay. And then I have, and then he gave me such a heart for them. And I'm actually so grateful for them as my neighbors now. And he's given me a heart for the sweet, like, family. So, anyways, hopefully that was out of fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, 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 what I mean? Um, I've had that same issue also for me, too. I mean, not the exact same issue, but, but um, having difficult relationships with people close by. Um, and... God changed the whole situation and he did the same thing he started telling me to pray for them who were my quote enemies at that time right and I I'm, I'm just in the beginnings of learning about this but what I have found is that it brings a lot more peace to us yeah because instead of being angry mm -hmm. we're praying for them and for him to do something which takes kind of the weight off of our shoulders to try to handle it ourselves because that's not working anyway so um, it it shifts your focus and um, I don't know. I guess it takes our focus more off of them onto the Lord, and so that brings peace. Wow. Amen. Yeah, he. I'm, I was amazed at how fast he turned it around. Like Pat, you saw it was one of the. I got so angry over it because it's like one. It was like first of all, it took me ten years to say to buy this house, and then it was such a battle to get a house, and then I finally got this house. I specifically got a house with a garage because I needed the garage. Then I had to get a different car to move up here. So to get the car into the driveway, I can only back in to back in. I need that spot to directly in front. I mean, it was like a very, like it's been a, a long, like a lot has gone into this. I find, And I paid extra for a garage. So I got the garage, but it's a steep driveway. I have to back in. And these people are just, they have all these other places to park. All these other, and they're not even, they don't own it, they're renting. But they're, they took up a whole street. And they parked, it's especially right where I said, please don't. And it's just like, wow. And they saw me struggling to get in. And they were just eating and watching me struggle. That's when I got mad. 
I was like, are you kidding me? I'm like, who does that? You know? And then I was so mad. He's a witness. And then the Lord started convicting me. It was a special day. Very special. And uh, he started convicting me. Mm -hmm. Like, why are you so angry? And I'm like, because, Lord, you know I worked so hard to get this house. And you know I paid extra for the garage. And I had to get this car. And I have to back in. He's like, yeah. And forgive. Don't hate your brother. I'm like, okay. And then I started praying. Just pray. Pray for your enemy. Even though they're really not my enemy. But in that moment, it felt, when they're eating while they're watching me struggle, that felt kind of like a taunt. You know? Yeah. It was very disrespectful and just like. And that's after you already talked to him? After I'd already talked to him. Yeah. And the guy was like, well, we'll be here if you need us to move. And they're watching me struggle. And he's just like, watching me struggle. And I was like, oh my gosh. So it's not that I wasn't justified in being angry. I was. We can be justified. People can do the wrong thing. But, but he's looking at our response, right? That's what Eddie was saying. That was the nugget I got from our conversation today and last Sunday is there are offenses. They will come. Just read that in scripture. Jesus warned, they will come. We are in days where there's a lot of evil in the world. There are tares and there are wheat. There are goats and there are sheep. There are wolves in sheep's clothing. That's what scripture tells us. I'm not saying who's who. That's God's job. But I'm saying if we aren't aware that there's going to be people that are going to treat us wrong. Pete, the world will hate us if we have Jesus living inside us. So be prepared. Don't be caught off guard. Just know that and go, okay, how am I going to react? Oh, this is happening again. I've got another test. It's another opportunity to grow. It's an opportunity to go higher and higher in the Lord. Right? Glory to glory. And if you look at it that way, and then the other thing that always helps me is with that people-pleasing thing that I've always wrestled with, is I, I and I go, okay, Lord, the most important thing is that when I die, when I go to be before you, I want to hear, good job, faithful servant. That is the most important thing. You know, but, but am I going to hear that if I'm not forgiving and I'm not, uh, no. So that's what motivates me. You know, when and, and we never know how long we have. I could have another 50 years, I could have five, I could have five, I, I don't know. I don't know how long my mission is here. But I always try to live every life, every day, like what if it's your last? Keep a short record. Don't forgive. And if, if someone has really hurt you, now again, pastorally, if I see somebody doing stuff that's hurting others as well, that's where I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to deal with this. Whether I like it or not, you know, thank you. Um, I have to say something because I feel a responsibility for the rest of the sheep in the flock, right? And that's a challenge. So Bible says, pray for your leaders, whatever, any, any leadership I have, just pray for me. I consider so just a servant. I don't, I never asked to be a leader, by the way, never asked, never. But somehow God keeps putting me in positions and I'm just like, help. So anyways, bless you guys. Love you. I hope that blessed you and it blessed me to hear the word of the Lord. Thank you for the conversation today. Bye.